Ricky Ticky Tabby by Rudyard Kipling. Before we start reading, we are going to go over the words that are on the bottom of the page and to the right of every page in the first part of the story. So on page 74, on the bottom, it has number one, the Sigoli Cantonment, which is an area in India that was home to a British military base. So this is where the story is going to take place in India. Number two says Chachandra. Chuchandra is the muskrat, which we saw a picture of um, before we started the story, who lives in the house. On the right-hand side, on page 74, there's a couple of things, analyze visuals and predict, but we're going to look beneath that where it says revive, which is a verb, which means to return to life or consciousness. So if you are unconscious, passed out, or even dead, if you are revived, it means you have returned to life. So they have revived you. On page 75 is a picture of what they are showing as representing the bungalow where the family lives. On page 76, there is one vocabulary word on the right-hand side, and that word is veranda which is a noun, it's a thing, and it's a long open porch, usually with a roof. So it's a big porch with an overhang to kind of give you some shade. On page 77, on the bottom, number three says hood, an expanded part on or near the head of an animal. So we looked at the cobra's hood, which expands when it's agitated, it's up by its head. Number four is Brahm, which is another name for Brahma, the creator of the universe in the Hindu religion. So many people in India follow the Hindu religion, and Brahm is one of their main gods. On the right-hand side of page 77, it has one vocabulary word, which is cower, which means to crouch or shrink down in fear. So if you're scared, you're going to cower and kind of shrink up. On page 78, we have one vocabulary word, which is fledgling, noun. That's a young bird that has recently grown its flight feathers. So when birds are first born, we kind of call them little chicks. But as they start to grow their feathers and open their eyes, but they still can't quite fly, they're called fledglings. So that those are our words for part um, one. And then we will uh, get into the rest of the words when we start part two. So back to page 74 and we'll begin reading. Ricky Ticky Tavi by Rudyard Kipling. This is the story of the great war that Ricky Ticky Tavi fought single-handed through the bathrooms of the big bungalow in Sigoli Cantonment. Darzi, the tailor bird, helped him, and Chuchandra, the muskrat, who never comes out into the middle of the floor, but always creeps round by the wall, gave him advice. But Ricky Ticky did the real fighting. He was a mongoose, rather like a little cat in his fur and his tail, but quite like a weasel in his head and his habits. His eyes and the end of his restless nose were pink. He could scratch himself anywhere he pleased with any leg, front or back, that he chose to use. He could fluff up his tail till it looked like a bottle brush, and his war cry as he scuttled through the long grass was, Rick tick ticky ticky tick one day a high summer flood washed him out of the burrow where he lived with his father and mother and carried him kicking and clucking down a roadside ditch he found a little wisp of grass floating there and clung to it till he lost his senses when he revived he was lying in the hot sun on the middle of a garden path very draggled indeed and a small boy was saying here's a dead mongoose let's have a funeral no, said his mother. Let's take him in and dry him. Perhaps he isn't really dead. They took him into the house, and a big man picked him up between his finger and thumb and said he was not dead, but half choked. 
So they wrapped him in cotton wool and warmed him over a little fire, and he opened his eyes and sneezed. Now, said the big man, he was an English man who had just moved into the bungalow. Don't frighten him and we'll see what he'll do. It is the hardest thing in the world to frighten a mongoose because he is eaten up from nose to tail with curiosity. The motto of all the mongoose family is run and find out. And Ricky Ticky was a true mongoose. He looked at the cotton wool, decided that it was not good to eat, ran all round the table, sat up and put his fur in order, scratched himself, and jumped on the small boy's shoulder. Don't be frightened, Teddy, said his father. That's his way of making friends. Ouch! He's tickling under my chin, said Teddy. Ricky Ticky looked down between the boy's collar and neck, snuffed at his ear, and climbed down to the floor, where he sat, rubbing his nose. Good grace, gracious, said Teddy's mother, and that's a wild creature. I suppose he's so tame because we've been kind to him. All mongooses are like that, said her husband. If Teddy doesn't pick him up by the tail or try to put him in a cage, he'll run in and out of the house all day long. Let's give him something to eat. They gave him a little piece of raw meat. Ricky Ticky liked it immensely, and when it was finished, he went out into the veranda and sat in the sunshine and fluffed up his fur to make it dry to the roots. Then he felt better. There are more things to find out about in this house, he said to himself, than all my family could find out in all their lives. I shall certainly stay and find out. He spent all that day roaming over the house. He nearly drowned himself in the bathtubs, put his nose into the ink on a writing table, and burnt it on the end of the big man's cigar, for he climbed up in the big man's lap to see how writing was done. At nightfall, he ran into Teddy's nursery to watch how kerosene lamps were lighted, and when Teddy went to bed, Ricky Ticky climbed up too. But he was a restless companion, because he had to get up and attend to every noise all through the night and find out what made it. Teddy's mother and father came in the last thing to look at their boy, and Ricky Ticky was awake on the pillow. I don't like that, said Teddy's mother. He may bite the child. He'll do no such thing, said the father. Teddy is safer with that little beast than if he had a bloodhound to watch him. If a snake came into the nursery now... But Teddy's mother wouldn't think of anything so awful. Early in the morning... Ricky Ticky came to early breakfast in the veranda, riding on Teddy's shoulder, and they gave him banana and some boiled egg, and he sat on all their laps one after the other, because every well-brought-up mongoose always hopes to be a house mongoose some day and have rooms to run about in. And Ricky Ticky's mother, she used to live in the general's house at Seagully, had carefully told Ricky what to do if he ever came across white men. Then, Ricky Ticky went out into the garden to see what was to be seen. It was a large garden, only, only half cultivated, with bushes as big as summer houses, of marshalnell roses, lime and orange trees, clumps of bamboos, and thickets of high grass. Ricky Ticky licked his lips. This is a splendid hunting ground, he said, and his tail grew bottle brushy at the thought of it and he scuttled up and down the garden, snuffing here and there, till he heard very sorrowful voices in a thorn bush. It was Darzee, the tailor bird, and his wife. They had made a beautiful nest by pulling two big leaves together and stitching them up the edges with fibers, and had filled the hollow with cotton and downy fluff. The nest swayed to and fro as they sat on the rim and cried. "'What is the matter?' asked Ricky Ticky. We are very miserable, said Darzee. One of our babies fell out of the nest yesterday, and Nag ate him. Hm, said Ricky Ticky. That is very sad, but I am a stranger here. Who is Nag? Darzee and his wife only cowered down in the nest without answering, for from the thick grass at the foot of the bush there came a low hiss, a horrid, cold sound that made Ricky Ticky jump back two clear feet. Then, inch by inch out of the grass, rose up the head and spread hood of Nag, the big black cobra, and he was five feet long from tongue to tail. When he had lifted one-third of himself clear, off, clear of the ground, he stayed, balancing to and fro exactly as a dandelion tuft balances in the wind, and he looked at Ricky Ticky 
with the wicked snake's eyes that never change their expression, whatever the snake may be thinking of. Who is Nag? said he. I am Nag. The great god Brahm put his mark upon all our people when the first cobra spread his hood to keep the sun off Brahm as he slept. Look and be afraid. He spread out his hood more than ever, and Rikki Tikki saw the spectacle mark on the back of it that looks exactly like the eye part of a hook and eye fastening. He was afraid for the minute, but it was impossible for a mongoose to stay frightened for any length of time. And though Rikki Tikki had never met a live cobra before, his mother had fed him on dead ones, and he knew that all a grown mongoose's business in life was to fight and eat snakes. Nag knew that too, and at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid. Well, said Rikki Tikki, and his tail began to fluff up again. Marks or no marks, do you think it is right for you to eat fledglings out of a nest? Nag was thinking to himself and watching the least little movement in the grass behind Rikki Tikki. He knew that mongooses in the garden meant death sooner or later for him and his family but he wanted to get Rikki Tikki off his guard. So he dropped his head a little and put it on one side. Let us talk, he said. You eat eggs. Why should not I eat birds? Behind you, look behind you, sang Darzy. Rikki Tikki knew better than to waste time in staring. He jumped up in the air as high as he could, and just under him whizzed by the head of Nagina, Nag's wicked wife. She had crept up behind him as he was talking to make an end of him, and he heard her savage hiss as the stroke missed. He came down almost across her back, and if he had been an old mongoose, he would have known that then was the time to break her back with one bite. But he was afraid of the terrible lashing return stroke of the cobra. He bit, indeed, but did not bite long enough, and he jumped clear of the whisking tail, leaving Nagina torn and angry. Wicked, wicked Darzy, said Nag, lashing up as high as he could reach toward the nest in the thorn bush. But Darzy had built it out of the reach of snakes, and it only swayed to and fro. Rikki Tikki felt his eyes growing red and hot. When a mongoose's eyes grow red, he is angry. And he sat back on his tail and hind legs like a little kangaroo and looked all around him and chattered with rage. But Nag and Nagina had disappeared into the grass. When a snake misses its stroke, it never stays or gives any sign of what it means to do next. Rikki Tikki did not care to follow them, for he did not feel sure that he could manage two snakes at once. So he trotted off to the gravel path near the house and sat down to think. It was a serious matter for him. <laughs>